All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. So I first and foremost would like to thank the ADNF meeting organizers for inviting me to this great seminar series. I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you uh, my PhD work. I would also like to uh, apologize actually because I'm still in Paris and uh, unfortunately I won't be able to be live with you today, but I still hope that my presentation will spark some interest and uh, if anything, uh, make sure to, um, to send me an email with any questions you would have. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the work I carried out uh, in the lab of uh, Alain Chedotal at the Institut de la Vision. And uh, this is in uh, Paris at Sorbonne uh, University. And during my PhD work, I looked a little bit at the development of the visual projections. And in particular, how this, what, are, what were the cellular bases of binocular vision and how these may have come up during evolution. So very quickly, <clears throat> what is binocular vision. So in a simpler way of saying it, it's depth perception or 3D vision. And for those of you who may not be so familiar with the visual system, our visual stimuli come in, uh, in one of the eyes. I hope that you can see my, uh, my arrow. So it, visual stimulus comes in one eye and then the visual neurons that are known as the retinal ganglion cells will project axons along the optic nerve and will either cross the ventral diencephalon at a region known as the optic chiasm to go into the contralateral <clears throat> brain, or they will stay in the same side and go to the ipsilateral brain. So these contralateral projections, uh, retinal ganglion cells will be known as contralateral visual projections and the ones staying on the same side, ipsilateral visual projections. So what are the functional, what's the functional significance of, of these components is that each visual thalamus will actually receive input from both eyes. And why is this important? Well, if you look at the box here at the top, your left eye will see uh, will have a different perspective of this box from the right eye. Since one visual thalamus, thalamus will receive both input, binocular neurons in the visual thalamus will be able to compute the difference between the left and the right eye and give you a 3D image. So this is the basis, really the cellular basis of 3D vision. So you can imagine that this is really important and makes a lot of sense if our visual field overlap between the left and the right eye, because then that means that the information here that overlaps between the two eyes can be computed and seen as in 3D. But then this loses all of its uh, interest if eyes of an organism are completely lateral and do not overlap at all, because then that means that all of the visual stimulus will go only in one eye and not in the other. So evolutionarily, this helps us understand a little bit what's going on. Us humans, it makes a lot of sense that we have a big binocular field since during evolution, we heavily um, depended on uh, hunter-gatherer um, uh, environmental uh, cues in order to feed and survive, which means that we have a smaller field of view. So we only see a bit more than 180 degrees, but a lot of this field of view allows us to see in 3D. Now, if we look at the example uh, below, which is the rabbit, for example, his environmental niche will mean that he can be heavily predated on by um, many predators in the wild. And so the advantage, the evolutionary advantage for the rabbit will be to be able to see his world or his environment in a 360 degree manner in order to see any possible or potential predator. And this is why the eyes of the rabbit are very lateral, which means that then he can have almost a 360 degree field of view. But since the eyes are so lateral, 
that means that there is a very little binocular field. And so uh, several studies um, or several decades of studies have shown that this binocular field of view translates in uh, the visual projections I was talking to you on this graph. So if we look at just mammals, for example, so mice, ferrets, and primates, we see that their eyes um, become more and more converged. So mice have more lateral eyes than ferrets, and ferrets have more lateral eyes than primates. And when we look at the retina of these animals, we see that in red here, ipsilateral retinal projections increase with the amount of convergence of the eyes to reach up to 50% in humans. And so this is quite interesting. And what happens with the rest of the animal kingdom? So here, I just want to bring your attention a little bit to the left of the slide and to look at fish. So if we look at zebrafish, which is the most uh, used animal model for now, uh, sorry, most used fish animal model, well, we see that their eyes are very lateral. And when we look at the retina of zebrafish, we see no ipsilateral projections. So this uh, sticks to a model which is known in the literature as the newton muller gooden law. But if we look a little bit closer in the literature, uh, more recent work has shown that the zebrafish that I was just talking to you about can actually engage in a behavior while they're um, carrying out a capture prey, uh, prey capture behavior, for example, in this tank, the zebrafish were left with paramecia. And you see that when the zebrafish engages in a prey capture behavior, it converges its eyes. And this eye convergence that you can see here actually increases or doubles the amount of binocular visual field that these uh, fish have which means that there must be some kind of function for this increase in binocular vision. So we next went a little bit further in, in the literature. And actually, if we look back in the 70s and the 80s, we see that uh, there are several papers that describe ipsilateral retinal projections in certain fish species. And so uh, you can see here several examples in the catfish and in the piranhas. But the problem with these studies is that none of them have been taken up since. And no studies have really gathered this information to know whether, why do some fish have ipsilateral projections and others don't? And um, to what extent? And so these, these questions remain completely open. So, so far in the literature, I'm going to show you a phylogenic tree, which I'll show uh, several times during the presentation. So I'll take a bit of time here. Here, the black dots, more than 500 million years ago, is the common vertebrate ancestor. Since this ancestor, there's been several um, branches of divergence that gave rise to many different um, phyla, such as the jawless fish, lampreys, or the sharks and modern day fish, such as the raven fish, all the way to the amphibians. So there's an event that occurred around more than 400 million years ago where all the life was in the sea and switched from sea to land. So life colonized land. And so far in the literature, what we find is a lot of reference to the fact that ipsilateral retinal projections emerged during this water to land transition. And indeed we see in amphibians, the appearance of ipsilateral projections as well as in mammals. What we also find in the literature is that birds, for example, here in the bottom of the, of the phylogenic tree, appear to have lost ipsilateral projections. So at least so far, we know that there was an event where ipsilateral projections were acquired and independently lost in certain fillet, in birds, for example. So the question that we had was, well, what's going on with the fish? So we know that some have ipsilateral projections, some don't. We're not sure whether this is the case or not. And 
um, Rayfit fish are actually a, a great uh, area to start since they represent the most diverse uh, group of uh, vertebrates with more than 300,000 species. And so since they're so diverse, they have completely different environmental uh, environments. And so uh, it, it's very interesting to look at that. So the way we wanted to start testing this was to select different fish, inject a cholerotoxin coupled to a, an Alexa fluorescent dye, so this is an entero and retrograde tracer, which we would inject in the eye, and then will travel all along the optic nerve into the brain. So the idea is to try to be the least biased as possible and to label all of the retinal projections that leave the eye and go to the brain. And to make sure that we keep this unbiased approach, we then wanted to take the brains and the optic nerves of these fish and clear these brains and reconstitute in three dimension using light sheet fluorescence microscopy, all of the projections that may be in the entire brain. So the first big question that we had was what strategy do we use to choose the fish we will investigate? And so I spoke a little bit about this earlier with eye convergence. So this is work we carried out with uh, the lab of Filippo Delbene at the Institut de la Vision. And together we thought, well, if in mammals, the amount of eye convergence leads to more ipsilateral projections, then this may be the case in fish. So we took some fish with very frontal based eyes, such as the mud skipper here, or the puffer fish, who you can see here. And then we took some fish with laterally positioned eyes, such as the sturgeon that has eyes that are really small. You can see them here. They're on the each side of the head and they're separated by a very long nose. And here the long nose gar is in the same kind of example with very lateral eyes and a very, very small uh, binocular field. So the hypothesis here was that frontal based eyes would have a binocular field and maybe would have ipsilateral projections, whereas the ones at the bottom would not. So here I'm just showing you um, data sets from the front based eyes. And what you can see here is the entire brain of the, of the fish with the optic nerves labeled. So here is the right eye, right optic nerve and the right brain. And here's the left optic nerve and the left brain. What you can appreciate right from the beginning of both of these fish is that you can follow the optic nerve all along its tract, all the prethalamic nuclei and the optic tecta of these fish, and you see no staining in the ipsilateral side. So all of the projections in these fish cross the optic chiasm and go to the contralateral side. So this was a little bit unintuitive and went a little bit against our hypothesis, which uh, was a bit annoying. So we, we went ahead and looked at the next fish. So the ones with lateral position eyes. So here again, you can see the brain of these fish. In right, uh, sorry, in purple, you see the right, the right eye and the left eye in green. What you can see right from the beginning is that we do have a huge amount of projections that go to the contralateral brain. But if we follow the optic nerve, we see that indeed we have projections that do go in the ipsilateral side. So here on this uh, snapshot, you see a little bit clearer in the long nose gar, you have contralateral projections that go to the contralateral hemisphere and ipsilateral projections that also go to the ipsilateral hemisphere. So this means that these fish that have eyes that are completely lateral indeed have ipsilateral projections. So they have um, bilateral projections. So this was completely against what we thought. So we started thinking, well, how could we explain this? Maybe one of the ways we could explain it if the eye convergence was not it, was that the lifestyle of these fish was uh, particularly different and was uh, the reason for them to need binocular vision. The problem with this way of thinking was that actually the mud skipper, the puffer fish, and the long nose gar are all predatory fish. So they're all no diurnal and they all mm, hunt to uh, live, live, uh, live fish. 
the Lomnos gar has a bilateral projection, but both of these fish, puffer fish and mudskipper, only have contralateral projections. So this goes against this hypothesis. And moreover, the sturgeon that has bilateral projections is actually a fish which is a bottom dweller fish and does not rely whatsoever on vision to, um, to feed. It relies actually on these, uh, these organs at the bottom of its, uh, of its nose. So we started thinking a little bit and we thought, what about if we think about these fish in a phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic way? Maybe it's something about their evolution or the way that they came to be is different between these fish. And so here I'm showing you the mudskipper and the puffer fish, which are actually um, on this uh, phylogenetic tree, all in, um, in the teleost group. So teleosts are actually what we know nowadays as a modern fish, and they comprise more than 90% of fish that we know today. And they're modern, and the separation occurred more than 300 million years ago. S the sturgeon and the long nose guard that both have bilateral projections, actually both are grouped in older, um, uh, they are older fish, more basal fish in phylo phylogenically, and they diverged from the common ancestor much earlier, more than 350 million years ago for the, for the sturgeon. And so this way of thinking seemed to stick and actually work. So we carried out a lot of other injections and I'm putting here the phylogenetic tree of all of the fish we've injected. And you see that if we look at the common uh, raffin fish ancestor, which was the armored bichir, we see ipsilateral projections, whereas teleosts have absolutely no uh, bilateral projections. And this is kind of interesting because if we look a bit closer and quantify the amount of ipsilateral projections, it seems that they decrease evolutionarily. So here in pink, you have the sturgeon, here the long nose gar, and here the butterfly fish. And you see that the amount of ipsilateral projections seems to decrease. So there, there's a trend there. If we investigate this a bit further, we see that non teleost fish seem to have an optic nerve that intermingles and crosses at a region that we see in mammals such as the optic chiasm. So here, if you look at a, a cross section of this 3D image, you see that the optic nerve crosses the optic chiasm here, intermingles with the other optic nerve, and then crosses the brain. If you look at the teleos brains, so here I'm just showing you three examples, the, the puffer fish that we saw earlier and the mud skipper, and this is another fish we've injected you see that the optic nerves just go on top of each other. But when you look at a cross section of this 3D image, you see that these optic nerves are not at all intermingled and don't even intersect one another. So this is further evidence showing that teleosts may have evolved uh, to, to lose bilateral projections. So this was super interesting and we wanted to go a little bit further with this. And we knew that um, one of the best known molecular markers for ipsilateral projections for the past decades has been the zinc finger-like protein uh, member family um, and, and the ZIC2 especially. This transcription factor is expressed by ipsilateral projections. It, it increases the, or upregulates the expression of an axon guidance receptor, transmembrane receptor known as FB1. FB1 is expressed all along the axon. And once FB1 encounters a ligand known as FNB2, it is repulsed at the midline, which forces axons to go ipsilateral. And this is quite neat because we've seen in several studies now that ZIC2 seems to be um, present evolutionarily. So if you look at mammals, for example, ferrets that have more centrally positioned eyes have a higher amount of ZIC2 positive cells, more than 50, uh, around 15% of their retina. Whereas zebrafish that have lateral eyes have no ZIC2 expressing cells. 
So we wanted to investigate this in our fish that have uh, bilateral projections. And we wanted to begin with one of the fish that was very obvious and that had a big ipsilateral projection. And this was the long nose gar. So for this, we decided to contact Ingo Brash um, in the United States and uh, that has done a lot of work on the, on the long nose gar to, uh, to help us a little bit on, uh, on this journey. The first thing that we had to do was, well, not, nothing was known actually about these, uh, these fish and the development of their visual system. So what I did was I took fish or lepisosteus, so long nose gar embryos, and analyzed them during development. So here you can see at two or three days, this is really early on during development. And I carried out a uh, whole month immunostaining for uh, retinal ganglion cells here, islet one, and alpha tubulin, ac sorry, acetylated tubulin, that's a pan-neuronal marker. And you see here that at six to seven days, the eye begins to develop a little bit more, and we start beginning to see more retinal ganglion cells, and also uh, a beginning of the development of the optic nerve that you can see here at the bottom of the image. So the, then we had a better idea of the development when the optic nerve was going to form. And indeed, when we observed the strongest amount of retinal ganglion cells that had actually projected and crossed at the optic chiasm was seven to 18 days post fertilization. And here you can see acetylated tubulin and islet one. So this, these are all the retinal ganglion cells here. And in white, you can see all of the, their visual projections going towards the optic nerve. So now we had an idea of which age group we wanted to look at. And we wanted to look at this famous transcription factor, ZIG2. So here is a cross section uh, in the middle of the, of the eye of this long nose gar. And these are in situ hybridizations of ZIG2. What you can see here is that ZIG2 is localized only in the central uh, part of the, of the retina of these fish, which is known as the ciliary margin zone. This is a highly proliferative zone that basically is going to nourish the retina throughout the life of the fish and give new cells to the retina. So these are progenitor cells. When we did a little bit of uh, immun immunohistochemistry characterization of these cells, uh, molecular characterization, we saw that uh, ZIG2 positive cells here were PCNA uh, positive, which means that they're highly proliferative cells and that they are progenitor cells. But when we look at a marker for retinal ganglion cells, which is islet one, we see that they're absolutely not expressing ZIG2. So this was a, a problem because it meant that ZIG2 was not expressed in ipsilateral or in any retinal ganglion cells. So other studies have come out uh, recently that have shown that ZIG2 may not be the only uh, member of the family to induce ipsilateral ganglion cells. There's other members of the family and especially ZIG1 and ZIG5. So we decided to look at these uh, two uh, transcription factors. And here again, an in-situ hybridization, you see that there's a highly proliferative zone here that nicely expresses ZIG5 and ZIG1, but nowhere else in the region. We wanted to look a little bit further. And remember, I talked to you about FB1 and FNB2. And here you see that both FB1 and FNB2 are not expressed in retinal ganglion cells. And um, remember, FB1 is the receptor, which is expressed by ganglion cells normally and FNB2, the ligand secreted at the optic chiasm. And here, when you see at a cross section of the uh, ventral diencephalon of the long nose gar, you see there's absolutely no expression of FNB2. So all of this means that ZIG2 and all of the molecular transcription down cascade um, does not seem to be conserved in the long nose gar. So altogether, uh, what we believe is going on is that ipsilateral retinal projections here in green may have appeared as early as the common raffin fish ancestor and would have been passed on towards other filet. So I didn't have time to show you the data from the lungfish, but uh, collaboration with Rodrigo Suarez 
um, in, in um, Australia has also shown that uh, we have ipsilateral projections in this group, um, passed it on to amphibians and mammals as well. However, the picture is a little bit more complicated because what we see is more of a rainbow type of expression where raffin fish have ipsilateral projections, but evolutionarily began to lose this trait, probably because it didn't provide any functional interest for their, uh, for any functional purpose for them. So this poses a lot of interesting question, whether, for example, birds uh, really do not possess ipsilateral projections, or if we investigate more species, we'll start to see a possibility of ipsilateral projections as well. Um, but the take home message is really that um, the water to land transition was not the event that uh, launched the appearance of ipsilateral projections. This is something that occurred way before the water to land transition, but that perhaps amphibians and mammals they evolved a functional purpose for these um, remnants of ipsilateral projections. Uh, that have given us today this uh, depth perception. So with that, I would like to thank um, the lab, of course, of Alain Chedota, which is, it was such a great experience and a great mentorship. I'm uh, very uh, thankful for this. Uh, I would, of course, like to thank the collaborators because this was a worldwide initiative and without them, this project would have just not gone anywhere. So I'd like to, of course, thank Filippo Del Bene and Karine, Juliette, Shahad for all of their work on, the, on this study. Of course, I mentioned Rodrigo Suarez, Fabio and Peter that helped us with all of the lungfish um, data that I didn't have time to show. Ingo Brack, of course, for all of the spotted gar data. Uh, Eloisa uh, helped us with the molecular aspects of ZIC2, um, it, which is also part of some data I couldn't show. And Silvia Eto helped us with the Astinax uh, work. So I'll leave you with this little video of my best friend, the long nose Gar, uh, just to uh, maybe um, leave you with the idea that in order to really fully understand the biological process, we must diversify our animal models and we, we have to integrate a, a wider array of animals to, to uh, enrich our understanding of uh, even the most basic uh, neuroscience, developmental neuroscience uh, processes. So thank you very much. And uh, really, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to email me. Thank you so much.